from the second lesson of morning prayer. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And from our gospel, if thou be the Son of God, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. We beseech you, says St. Paul in our epistle this morning, that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. And while this sentence was historically addressed to the first century church of Corinth, this morning the church Catholic addresses it to us. But what is that grace that we are bidden not to waste? And what is it to receive it in vain? Well, to answer the second question first, to receive a gift in vain is surely to receive it indeed, but not to use it for its true purpose. The Father's Day power tool, for example, given and received, but destined never to be used in fulfillment of any household project, or a book given and read, never read. Surely these gifts have been, from the point of view of the purpose for which they were made, and therefore presumably given, been received in vain. It has to do, in other words, with the end to which both the intrinsic nature of the gift and the intention of the giver are ordered and directed. So what then is the grace, the gift, that St. Paul and the Church pleads with us not to waste? Well, that answer is likely a bit more complicated Several answers might be given and would need to be given depending on the point of view from which we view the question. Liturgically speaking, it must surely be the grace of illumination, mediated by the liturgy's symbolic form. Since Christmas, for example, the Church has presented to our imagination and our understanding divine wisdom in his incarnate form. The infant, the boy of twelve, the miracle worker, the healer, so that in contemplating the actions of his human nature, we might intuit the divine and ourselves be transformed by that renewing of our minds. Of course, we also receive the gift of the grace of God sacramentally, weekly or even daily through the Holy Eucharist, as our Lord gives himself to be consumed by us gives his life to be appropriated by us until our lives can be said to be in their entirety his life in us. Yet all of these graces of the Christian life, and any other of which we might think, depend radically upon the initial grace of baptism, wherein, as our catechism says, we are made members of Christ, children of God, and inheritors of the kingdom of heaven. Upon the grace of sonship that we were given there depend all the other graces of the Christian life, and ultimately all other graces are in service of either the preparation of or augmentation of that initial gift. To receive any gift, any, any grace in vain, therefore, is not to use it as a son of God would know how to use it. But to know this, we must first know what it is to be a son of God, and herein lies the challenge. It's all well and good to be told that we have received divine adoption, but it tells us nothing whatsoever of what it means to be an adopted son of God, or how to live the new life that we have been given. For we have no idea what a son of God even is. There is, after all, only one son of God by nature, and he is, as he confesses, in the bosom of the invisible Father, and no human has seen him at any time. And yet, as we saw at Christmas and Epiphany, the same Son who shares the invisible life of the Father in eternity has willed to live his life not only in eternity, but also in time, in a form that we can grasp, so as to reveal the secrets of that Sonship to us, so that by imitating him, we might learn to live that life which he lives both eternally and lives at every moment of his life on earth. We are meant to become, that is to say, what he is. We are to become what he is. 
but we become what he is by watching him, by attempting to understand his thoughts and intentions, and then trying ourselves to think and intend them. But we have not only the resources of our poor guesswork as to what those thoughts and intentions were and are, but we have also the witness of the Spirit who knows the very mind and heart of God, for he is himself God. And we implore him to illumine our minds as we read and ponder, and to form those same intentions within us. And that is what we do, or we ought to do, whenever we read the Gospel. And thus, learn, we learn to live the life of sons of God by adoption. Now, while every word of the Gospels, and indeed of the whole of Scripture, is about this, and for this purpose, at least implicitly, our Gospel this morning is explicitly and clearly a story of Christ self-consciously thinking about the sonship he continuously lives, self-consciously aware of the temptation to act as a son would not, which is to say, the temptation to have received the grace of sonship in vain. Now, at that point in our Gospel, our Lord has just received the baptism of John, and the sonship that he has eternally, as the recipient of all that his Father is, has been revealed to him and to the assembled crowds. The eternal anointing of the Holy Spirit has been manifested in his flesh, the purpose of his life has been revealed, and yet the preparation of John for the kingdom is not yet complete. So what to do? Well, what he decides to do is to go apart and wait the summons to spend, as it were, the grace he has been given. And this is how our Lord is led, or as St. Mark says, driven, into the desert. And here, while he is alone, he undergoes human temptation. Now, there's no time to go into the specifics of each temptation just now, but just notice the form of the first two. If you are the Son of God, says the devil. The temptations that our Lord undergoes here are the temptation to use his sonship for an end that is purely his own. Yet the Son lives his life not for himself, but for the Father. All that the Son is and has, he receives from the Father, and he uniquely receives all that the Father is and has, so that there is nothing else remaining to receive. The Father begets a Son for the sole purpose of delighting in him, and the Son, knowing himself to be nothing other than the Father's image, delights entirely in the Father. The grace of sonship revealed in the baptism of Christ is the gift whereby the Son lives entirely for the Father in his human nature, and it is that is its purpose, and to use it to any other purpose would be to have received it in vain. Now very likely our Lord had at best only a faint idea of where his sonship would ultimately lead when he encountered the temptations in the desert. But while awaiting clarity on that score, he was unwilling to spend the grace given to any other purpose. And here we have the first lesson of Lent, that we must await with patience the word that will draw us closer to God than we were when we received his grace. And that we must await with, and we must resist the temptation to assume in the meantime that our will is his will. If we would live as sons of God, we must continue to watch the unique Son of God on the road to his own perfection, which ends at Golgotha. There, supremely, we see the grace of God received to its true purpose. This morning, we admit three catechumens to be prepared for baptism. In presenting themselves, they declare their desire to be made sons of God by adoption, and their willingness to accept what that means for their lives. Let us pray for them as they begin their formal journey to the rebirth in the font, the womb of the church. 
For only by their prayers and the prayers of the whole church for us will we be able to guard the grace of our own sonship until we come to its perfection in the happy-making vision of the one whose sonship we share in and through his Father and their Holy Spirit, to whom we ascribe as is our delight and their due, all might, majesty, dominion, and glory henceforth and forevermore. Amen.